Okay, it's 3.34, so I think um, it's time for us to go ahead and get started. So we would like to welcome everyone to the spring quarter seminar series for the School of Environmental and Forest Sciences, the University of Washington. Uh, the university acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And as someone who attends the University of Washington Seattle campus, I would also like to acknowledge that I am on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. So today's seminar is going to go until 4.30 p.m. and will be followed up by a student Q&A and discussion from 4.30 to 5 p.m. if you can stay with us until then. Uh, just as a reminder, during the seminar, we ask that you um, please feel free to ask questions and interact through the chat box and the Q&A functions at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our seminar today is going to be given by this year's graduate student invited speaker, Dr. Jane Zelikova. Uh, the graduate student invited speaker position is nominated and voted on by the CEFS graduate student body and Dr. Zelikova is actually our first seminar speaker to be selected through this process. So we're very excited to have her here with us today. <laughs> And Dr. Zelikova is an ecosystem scientist working at the intersection of climate science and policy. She attended the University of Georgia as an undergraduate and earned her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Colorado. Uh, Dr. Zelikova has been a Mendenhall Fellow at the United States Geological Service, a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the US Department of Energy, and a Chief Scientist at the Carbon 180. And she's currently a researcher at the University of Wyoming and a senior fellow at Carbon Plan, where she focuses on advancing the science of engineered and natural carbon sequestration. And as well as doing all of these things, Dr. Zelikova is also extremely active in advocacy and communication. She's a co-founder of 500 Women Scientists, a global grassroots organization with the mission to make science open, inclusive, and accessible. And she also co-founded Hey Girl Productions with the mission to bring a scientific eye to creative media projects. Dr. Zelikova also communicates and advocates for science through her writing and on podcasts, including contributing an essay to the recent best-selling book, All We Can Save. And so with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Zelikova. Oh, wow. Um... I didn't realize I was the first selected uh, speaker by the graduate students. I am incredibly honored, uh, so excited to be here. Really wish with all my heart I could be there in person and get a chance to hang out with everyone. Um, but this is the next best thing. So I'm really thankful to be here again. Thank you graduate students for inviting me. Um, okay, we're gonna do some virtual technology. I'm going to share my screen. I hid all of my tabs so you wouldn't know how incompetent I am at tab management, um, which is pretty terrible. So today I'm gonna actually talk to you about scientism, which is a term that maybe I made up uh, and maybe it's real and hopefully it catches on, but it's really, uh, I'm gonna talk to you about blending science and activism. And as a scientist, I'm gonna present you with some data on why activism is a good thing. Um, really quickly, a little bit about me, as, uh, as was mentioned during the introduction. I currently work at Carbon Plan, which is a really wonderful nonprofit organization that is using open data and open science for climate action. And I also uh, am a researcher at the University of Wyoming, and I still am involved with and on the board of 500 Women Scientists and working on some film projects uh, in my spare time, which is hard to come by these days. So today I'm gonna, recognizing that you all are already scientists that know a lot about climate change, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the climate change problem or more broadly, the issue that we have with too much carbon in the atmosphere. 
but I will just show this as kind of a foundational uh, graphic to understand where a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from that are causing um, increased concentrations of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is a graphic from Drawdown Review 2020. This is just one of many different ways that we can visualize greenhouse gas emissions and their sources. Um, and the biggest thing to take away from a graph like this is that the majority of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from electricity or power generation, that's about a quarter, the agriculture and land use would include forestry. Um, and then about 20% comes from industry. Industry includes things like fertilizer production, um, steel and cement production, things like industrial processes, oil refineries. Um, and then about 14 to 15% comes from transportation, 6% from buildings, and then 10% from other sources. And so a graphic like this is also kind of a visualization of opportunity because it shows us what are the different sectors where we can target our actions to reduce emissions and eliminate emissions. Um, and what are the different tools we have at our disposal to do that. And so rather than focus so much on the emissions side, um, today I'm gonna focus a lot more on the solution side of the equation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the technological solutions that we have at our disposal. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the nature-based solutions we have at our disposal. And then I'm gonna talk a lot about why we as scientists should start to get engaged in advocacy and activism around deploying these climate solutions as quickly as possible and why that's a good thing to do in general. So to balance the other graphic on the drawdown side and the solution side, um, we need to reduce atmospheric concentrations of carbon and other greenhouse gases pretty drastically. Um, and depending on which level of ambition we're going to be thinking about, let's say the Paris Climate Accord, uh, we need to be removing about half to a little bit under half of the carbon that's already in the atmosphere, um, in addition to eliminating all of the emissions that are going up into the atmosphere now. Um, and the tools that are at our disposal include reducing the, re the sources, so bringing all of those emissions I just talked about down to zero, supporting the sinks, and that could be both kind of protecting the current biological or ecological sinks we have and the carbon that's already stored in the biosphere and also harnessing the power of the biosphere to draw down even more carbon. And then the third really important lever is improving society and really focusing on um, fostering equality and equity for everyone um, as a, not because not just because it's the right thing to do, which absolutely it is, but also because it's a really critical climate solution. And so how do we do that? Uh, it's a really large challenge and lots of really smart people have thought a lot about it. Well, the first thing we have to do is reduce emissions. And there are lots of really interesting studies and thoughts about how to do that and a lot of debate. But one thing that I wanna just to kind of show you, um, and you may have already heard this in the news is that during the last kind of year and especially during the first three months of the pandemic, global emissions fell by 7%, um, just as a result of the change in how humans kind of interacted, moved around the planet, um, and that's a really meaningful reduction. That is the reduction we need to keep uh, keep going year after year if we are to meet our kind of really ambitious climate goals. Um, and so if you look at this graphic, this is from a paper that was published just earlier this year, you can see kind of in A, it's the broader pattern of uh, emissions rising, even though we're passing a lot of different sort of like accords, emissions are still continuing to rise. And then we see this really drastic dip um, at the beginning of the pandemic. And if we look at that more closely in the inset of graph B, you can see that those daily fossil um, associated CO2 emissions changed relative to levels, relative to the previous year, especially the month of April when there was a kind of a really severe lockdown across most of the world. But then in figure C, what's really interesting is you can see that not all nations had the same level of decrease in emissions and at the same time. And so upper middle income countries, mostly China had that really kind of a meaningful dip earlier on between January and April and then high income and low income countries. So including sort of the US and 
the EU and other countries experience that dip later on um, in April to May. So um, that's, that is all to say that we are capable of reducing emissions, but the really key part is that we can't have a pandemic every time we need to reduce emissions. So what are the lessons we can learn from a global pandemic and how can we think about reducing emissions going forward? Well, one really big thing is that what we could do is think about shifting our energy sources from those that dominate today and uh, more renewable um, and really fully clean electricity and power going forward. So in this graphic, it shows different kinds of energy sources from natural gas to coal to nuclear energy, renewable energy, hydro and other source of energy. And you can see that coal has been on a decline since um, the early like 20, 12, 2013. Um, and you can see kind of at the same time this rise in natural gas. Um, and so coal is being phased out in the US. Um, I believe that the US has already slated to retire more than 546 coal, fire, coal, coal fired power units. That's more than hundred gigawatts of generating capacity um, with an additional 17 gigawatts planned for 2025. So this is by 2025, we're gonna be retiring 120 gigawatts of coal generated power, which is a lot. Um, there are very few uh, coal plants that are still going to be operating by 2030. Um, I would say almost none. But the biggest thing is that at the same time, we have a rise in the use of natural gas and very few policies, at least enacted today, that are addressing natural gas. But what's really interesting and cool in this graphic is this really awesome, consistent upward trend of renewable energy that's non hydro. Um, and that's because of the deployment of solar and wind mostly as prices for the deployment of those renewable energy sources has drastically decreased. Um, and it's renewable energy is slated to continue to increase. Um, I put this screen grab of Dr. Leah Stokes's tweet the other day, I think it was just yesterday, um, talking about the clean electricity standard and how much it's gaining momentum. Um, the White House is supporting 80% clean energy or clean power by 2030. Um, that's a really aggressive, really ambitious target, much more ambitious than anything the Obama administration put out. Um, and if we do that, that's going to put us on track for a 100% clean power by 2035, which is incredible. Um, and a lot of this is being included in the Biden infrastructure bill, um, which means that it might pass without even having to have a Senate majority because of some weird rules about budget reconciliation. So um, it's really good news. It's nice to see this level of ambition. Of course, the devil is always in the details. But taking a little bit of a step back outside of the US, it's really important just to remember that what happens here isn't necessarily what's happening, happening in other places across the world. Um, and so this is a map of the global coal plant distribution. Um, things that are kind of lighter white or gray in color are plants that are slated to close. Um, and then things that are yellow are still operating. What's really key to note is that the yellow and the concentration of kind of pink um, and even purple under construction are concentrated outside of the US in places like Asia. Um, and so while we, we're doing a lot to reduce emissions in the US and in, in the EU, um, it's important to also support policies that, that help um, other countries transition to renewable energy as quickly as possible. And not kind of lock us into using coal in other places because of these new plants that are being constructed. Because once you sort of like put the capital in constructing a coal plant, you got to use it. So it's just good to remember that what happens here is important, but we also have to have a global perspective. And so just to go back to um, Leah Stokes's tweet, there was a really cool analysis that just came out in the last week or so from the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley that looked at what it's gonna look like to reach that 80% reduction by 2030 uh, goal and where the deployments of renewable energy are actually going to take place across the US. And I thought I, want, I wanted to show it because I wanted you to see the tiny little dot that is on the state of Washington, which is mostly the deployment of solar and some wind energy um, relative to the size of the, um, the graphics across other parts of the US. Um, but what's really cool about this analysis is they showed that in every state there's some potential for additional renewable energy deployment. And then the cost of that is offset a lot or almost entirely 
by savings in expenses associated with um, environmental pollution and health impacts from that pollution. So it's a really cost-effective strategy to reduce our emissions by 80% for 2030. Um, so um, I'm, I'm gonna provide citations for all of my um, links and graphics so you'll be able to access these reports later. And so the other big thing is to electrify. So a lot of people have been talking a lot about electrifying our transportation sector, thinking about electrifying um, sort of appliances and things like that. And what I find really remarkable, and I'm kind of old, is that never did I think I would see a commercial for an electric vehicle uh, or a company that's really like touting and going in our electric vehicles during the Super Bowl. And not that I watched the Super Bowl, but I definitely watched the commercial uh, with Will Ferrell that was kind of um, talking smack to Norway about electric vehicles. And it's sort of this signal of a cultural shift in how we think about electric vehicles and their kind of public acceptance um, that wasn't around even a year ago. And if we think about that and look at the pledges that large companies have actually made, um, it's really cool. So Volvo has pledged to go fully electric by 2030. Ford is gonna be selling only electric vehicles in Europe. Um, GM is gonna be fully electric by 2035. These are really bold commitments from companies that just a few years ago were fully supportive of um, a lot of sort of Trump era policies, um, especially around um, uh, not, not adhering to really, um, really stringent fuel economy standards. And so as this is happening, there's some really cool policy ideas that are being floated. And I think it's interesting just to think about like, what, how, what do we do to get electric vehicles everywhere? So people have talked about doing priority parking. If you're in an EV, you get a really nice parking spot. I have an electric vehicle, so that's something that I would be really excited about. Um, another is fast chargers everywhere. Right now, it's really hard to kind of figure out and plan long trips because there aren't fast chargers. And fast is relative. It still takes about an hour with the fastest chargers on the market to fully charge a battery. And then this other idea is happening in EU and China, which is battery swapping. So when you pull up to a station, I'm, not, I'm gonna call it a gas station, but it's actually gonna be a battery station. They take out your battery and pull in a fully charged one. So instead of sitting there and waiting for your charge, you just get a new battery. So people are thinking really creatively about these um, ideas, which is cool. And then the Biden infrastructure package includes $174 billion for electric vehicles. Um, that includes manufacturing and supply chain support and also installing lots of fast charging stations across the country, which is great. I live in Colorado and for example, there is no way I could drive to Wyoming currently in my electric vehicle because there are no chargers there. Um, and so hopefully this is something that will address that uh, range issue. So the other big thing is that in addition to electrifying and shifting away from fossil fuel uh, power, we have to increase how much power or energy we can store. And there's good news on that front too. Um, the US is ramping up hugely its capacity for energy storage. Um, if you look at this graphic, this is from 2013 to end of 2020, um, you can see this really huge spike in the deployment of energy storage, especially the, the purple column, which is the front of the meter. So that means kind of industrial scale, um, industrial scale uh, storage that's being used to supplement other energy sources or in times when those other energy sources are offline completely back up and provide energy. Um, and the reason that this is possible is because of investment in batteries, but also because batteries cost 80% less now than they did 10 years ago. And that's a really, really huge uh, decrease in cost. And so that is all to say, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening on the tech side, but technology alone isn't gonna save us or solve the climate change problem. And we have to really think about our ecological natural systems and how we can manage them in a way that helps protect what is already stored and enhance sinks in a way that helps draw more carbon down from the atmosphere. And so one thing we can do is thinking about growing plants. Plants are the original, the OG carbon drawdown machines. They do photosynthesis, they bring down carbon from the atmosphere, incorporate it into biomass, and oftentimes move it below ground and store it in carbon, uh, in soil carbon. 
And so if we think about places we can enhance or protect existing biomass, here is a map that shows existing biomass. This is from the second state of the carbon cycle report from a couple of years ago. One thing to note is Washington is very rich in biomass. You have massive amounts of trees and they're very large, uh, especially along the coast. Um, and so looking at a map like this, what it shows is where the biomass is uh, and where we can think about focusing resources and time and opportunity to really enhance or protect existing biomass uh, sinks. But one of the things we have to consider, and this is a paper that just came out last year uh, with some colleagues from Carbon Plan that were co-authors, um, is that forests as a natural climate solution face some really large limitations and risks, um, including risks associated with climate stress, uh, sort of increased and more severe droughts, um, human disturbance, which deforestation is absolutely an issue we, sh we should think about, um, though it's not as big of an issue in the US as it is elsewhere in the world. Um, certainly biotic agents. I live in Colorado. We've suffered massive uh, pine beetle outbreaks and have forests that are mostly brown as a result. And then of course, massive threats from fire. Um, and all of us have been living over the last few years with wildfire, wildfire as a constant threat. I know in Colorado, this is something that I've dealt with ever since I moved there in 2004, 2002, 2002, and um, it's just gotten worse. So as much as forests are a natural climate solution, we also have to consider how much stuff we could put into forests sort of saving us from climate change because forests are also responding to climate change. So it's never as simple as um, saying that forests are gonna save us. The other thing um, to think about is um, both, both growing and protecting existing carbon stocks um, that are in natural systems. And so a paper that came out in 2017 in PNAS estimated the potential for natural climate solutions to deliver climate mitigation by 2030. Um, and they looked at the potential of forests, agricultural lands, and wetlands. And they found that forests had immense potential to draw down carbon from the atmosphere at the level of pecograms of CO2 equivalent per year. Especially there was a lot of potential in reforestation and avoiding forest conversion. So instead of sort of cutting down trees, protecting them, um, and then improving uh, how we manage forests in general. On the ag side, there was smaller potential, but there was still a lot of potential associated with planting trees into croplands, doing better nutrient management, doing managed grazing, um, and broadly conservation agriculture, um, and also applying things like biochar and other soil amendments that can help sequester more carbon in the soil. And there was also a lot of bang for the buck um, in protecting coastal uh, wetlands and coastal ecosystems um, and restoring them. And what's really cool about this is there can be a lot of debate about the numbers. And I actually am happy to debate this paper. This is a Griscom et al. 2017 paper. But regardless of what, what the numbers actually are, I think it's important to note that all of these solutions have other really important co-benefits, including co-benefits for biodiversity, water quality, soil quality, and air quality. So we may think about them as a win-win and they're a win for climate and they're a win for, uh, for us and for humanity and for biodiversity. And so beyond sort of thinking about addressing the emissions side, the electricity sector, the broader kind of economic sector and thinking about natural um, ecosystems, what else can we do? And one big thing we can do is start to engage with these topics um, as scientists. Um, I believe most of the folks in the seminar are scientists. So I think this is really relevant for us to think about. How do we engage with these topics beyond just doing the science? What's interesting is to kind of note what the broader trends are around climate change. So when I started working on this topic in 2002, just aging myself a bit here, um, climate change just wasn't something people talked about. And to be very honest, it also wasn't something that I was concerned about. Um, until I started studying it, it wasn't something that I was even thinking about, definitely not um, acting upon. Uh, but that's changed. And so these, this graphic shows trends in 
worry about climate change. This is focused just on Americans, percentage of Americans that are worried about climate change broken down by political party or affiliation. And you can see the blue, um, the dark blue is liberal Democrats, the lighter blue is moderate or conservative Democrats. And then you sort of have independence and liberal moderate Republicans together, which I've always suspected independents were mostly Republicans. Um, that's just me. Um, and then we have conservative Republicans at the bottom. And regardless of the split among these groups, what's really interesting is that there is a general upward trend in worry, especially since somewhere around 2015. Um, we can see that this is a consistently growing. Folks are worried and concerned. Um, and even though there is a difference between parties, I think it's interesting to see conservative Republicans also being more concerned about climate change. And when we think about that a little bit more deeply, this is a study that just came out in the last couple of weeks maybe um, where they did a survey of more than a thousand folks that live in the Delaware River Basin. And they asked them, um, they presented them with a scenario. Basically, the Delaware, Delaware River Basin is polluted. Uh, to one group, they presented the scientific facts. So this is like, these are all the problems, the fertilizer runoff. Um, these are all the problems and why the river basin is polluted, giving them the science. To the other group, they presented a story about a man who died from eating contaminated shellfish. So focused on the story rather than the science. And what they found is that in general, people were willing to pay more to address the runoff problem once they heard the story relative to hearing the science. So the blue bars are the story focused communication. The yellow bars are the science communication. So when they heard the story, they were willing to pay more to address the problem. What's interesting though, is figure three at the bottom where they separated that effect looking at liberal responses versus conservative responses. And what they found is that liberals were way more likely to change their behavior and pay more once they heard the story, but Republicans were more likely to pay more when they heard the scientific facts. So what this is telling us, besides confirming the liberal bleeding heart situation, is that um, the way that we communicate science, especially the science of climate change or other things that may be um, controversial, um, has to be tailored to our audience in really specific ways. And we have to understand who our audience is and what is going to compel them to act. And in many cases, just throwing the scientific facts at people doesn't change their behavior. And this is certainly the case with other perceptions of climate um, and worry about climate. So this is a graphic from the Yale program on climate change communication where they do a lot of surveys around sort of like Americans attitudes about climate change. And one thing that's really interesting is that they've done this really comprehensive survey where they looked at um, the, a number of factors about how concerned people are about climate change but broke it down by demographics. And so they found that his, Hispanic or Latino com, uh, communities or folks were way more alarmed and concerned about climate change. Um, the vast majority of them were either concerned or alarmed. Um, that was also the case for uh, bla uh, black respondents to the survey and less so for white respondents. So it really kind of challenges this idea that um, only white people care about climate change and environmentalists are mostly white um, I think uh, this, this clearly shows that people of color are absolutely worried about climate change. And this makes sense because they're often the ones that bear the brunt of the impacts of climate change. Um, and as we think about the work that we do, be it as scientists or as communicators, we have to think about these kinds of audiences and the level of concern that they already have about the problem. And so what can we as scientists do with all of this information? Well, um, there's a lot. I think the first thing is we have to acknowledge that we are part of, we are both uh, part of and influenced by the culture at large. So science is a human construction with significant boundary conditions from nature. Or another way of saying it is from this other paper. Um, let me just let's see. Culture and power shape knowledge production by establishing the processes by which understanding, understandings are generated and disseminated. So 
what that is to say is science is influenced by and influences the broader kind of society at large and the existing cultural and power structures um, that we live in. And so both we as scientists and kind of the scientific enterprise. And we have to acknowledge that because this idea of um, objectivity, uh, it just isn't supported by evidence. We're, we're actually like not objective as humans and that's okay. So the first thing we can do is actually do science. Um, the first thing um, that we do as students is we learn and we try to become a technical expert in our field. And so Dr. Shanda Prescott Weinstein wrote this as kind of advice for graduate students who want to engage in activism. There's no substitute for becoming a technical expert in your field. Activism will not pass your defense for you and failing to develop that expertise will make your life as a postdoc and professor if you decide to become an academic, incredibly difficult. At some point, you need to teach this material. You need to be able to independently build a research program. If you stay in the academy, you may still need to know these skills for other jobs like coding. So that is to say, many of us feel really compelled to act um, and to advocate for things associated with climate change or other issues that we feel passionately about. Um, but Dr. Prescott Weinstein is pretty clear that no matter what, we have to become technical experts. And one of the biggest things is when we are technical experts, we're able to advocate from a really strong position of knowledge and expertise. And that also is a position of privilege. And so thinking about that, can we do science and do advocacy? Well, um, there are some studies that have looked at this, of course, because leave it to scientists to study the science of activism. Um, this paper came out pretty recently um, last year, looking at civil disobedience movements, such as the school strikes for climate and their effect in um, raising public awareness of the climate change emergency. And what's really cool, there's a lot happening in this graphic, so I'm gonna walk us through it. They did a survey, um, a pretty large survey, but they also uh, looked at Google search terms so, uh, related to climate change, like climate change, global warming, climate emergency, climate crisis, and climate action um, from tw 2017 through 2020. And what they found was um, these kind of big spikes in searching for climate change terms in Google that were associated with um, things like the IPCC special report, the one and a half degree report that came out that got a lot of media um, and it got a lot of people thinking about climate change. Also this really huge spike when the first um, global uh, school strike for climate happened. This is where a lot of kids all over the world all striked on the same day. It was a really big deal. It prompted a lot of people to search um, in Google for climate. Um, other things were other kind of large climate protests and big reports coming out like the next IPCC report. So what's interesting is that there's this interaction between civil disobedience, protest and ad advocacy and activism and the work that scientists do that produce these really important reports. So we need to actually be able to do both. Um, they also found that in a survey of 10,000 18 um, to 25 year olds, across 22 countries, so not just in the US, 41% of the respondents noted that climate change is the most important human rights issue facing the world. Second only was, the second was the regional climate pollution issue. So young people are really compelled to act. They're really passionate and climate change is one of the main things that they're worried about. And so the summary of that paper um, that I was just uh, talking about kind of noted a couple of things that I wanted to pull out as takeaways. One was to address the significant challenges facing society. We need the very best science, teachers and communicators capable of translating that science to motivate and inspire wider audiences and active engagement of the science community with the public and policymakers. So we need everyone and we need people who are both able to do the science and also teach and communicate that science to the people that need to use it. While activist contributes, activism contributes to transformations in society, science is needed to define the nature of the problems we face and point the way to the actions 
that need to be taken to address them. Science without activism is powerless to enact change. But activism without science will enact change without knowledge of the direction in which change is needed. To make constructive progress, both science and activism are needed to move society in the right direction with strength and purpose. Um, so it's one of these really lengthy uh, ways to say we need to have both and they actually need to go hand in hand. And so the other big question, um, and I think a lot of folks in scientists worry about this, is whether or not their engagement in advocacy hurts their credibility. And so of course, scientists did a study on that. And what they found is that scientists who engage in certain forms of advocacy may be able to do that without harming their credibility or the credibility of the broader kind of scientific community. And so here's one example of that particular study. They looked at a, they created a credibility score. Um, and basically they looked at the average credibility score for scientists that were communicating their recent findings. So that's just basic science communication versus the risks and impacts of the work that they're doing. This is again, focused on climate change in the study communicating policy options and consequences of different policy enact enactment, non-specific actions, and then very specific actions like reduction of CO2 or deployment of nuclear power. And what they found is that generally there were no significant differences across most of these categories. The only category that reduced credibility had to do with a very specific action, which is deployment of nuclear energy, which makes sense because nuclear energy is kind of fraught in our society and doesn't necessarily have a strong social license to operate. But everywhere else, communicating findings and an opinion about them and some suggestions for how to move forward and use those findings all had about the same level of credibility. So communicating and advocating does not change credibility. Um, and scholars posit that all statements made by scientists contain at least some degree of normative judgment. Therefore, it's more useful to think about foul advocacy as existing on a continuum based on relative amount of judgment inherent in the communication. What this is telling us is that all communication includes some level of judgment from us. Even if we think we're being objective, we're not because we're part of a broader society formed by it and in return sort of forming society as well. So advocacy is really a continuum and for most of advocacy actions, we don't pay a credibility price. So a couple of days ago, I posted on Twitter, I wanted to see if other folks had any ideas they wanted me to share about why they engage with science advocacy or activism. And I asked three questions. One was, why is it important for you to personally engage with science advocacy or activism? Two, what aspects feel the most urgent? And three, what are the day-to-day -day realities of engaging? Um, and I just wanted to share a couple of uh, responses. They, I got a bunch um, and I, I'm gonna think about how, what to do with the rest of them because it was really interesting. But one of the most interesting ones was this response from a woman of color who said, why she personally engages is because science isn't built to support people from my community and I want to change that. History shows that those in power won't. Two, what aspects feel the most urgent? bringing conversations about equity and justice to the center of science so it doesn't feel, doesn't continue to feel peripheral or tacked on. And number three, what's the day-to-day -day reality? Um, she said two things. First, providing support to my colleagues and students who are marginalized in science. A ton of this work is supporting people of color through the day-to-day. -day. And second, in presentations and conversations, I work to change the narrative about how we talk about who is in science and who science is being done for. So that's really insightful um, because a lot of the activism this person does is really about equity and justice in science, not about science necessarily itself. Another response that's a little shorter um, related to climate change. This person also a woman said, because we're out of time, um, her advice was bring in as many people as you can, create opportunities, normalize activism, be inclusive because we're out of time. And number three, making, make getting involved in advocacy a routine. So something that you do every day. So that's good. Um, it's good to know that folks are thinking about this um, and starting to make it kind of a reality.
And so beyond what we can do as individual scientists in terms of both doing our science and um, getting engaged personally in advocacy, especially in areas where we have expertise, I think the other thing we can do is support and uplift other movements, especially movements for equity and justice, especially movements that are led by people who have traditionally been pushed to the margins, um, not um, included, uh, not given equal access to resources. So this is just an example of, uh, you know, one, which is folks that are leading um, a protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline. A lot of these protests have been led by indigenous uh, activists um, who often don't have access to the same kind of resources. And um, I think these are the kinds of movements that could really benefit from additional support, especially from scientists. Um, the other thing is to think about who we are lending support to. So I wanted to show this. Um, this is another figure from the Yale um, Center for Climate Communication. Again, thinking about the level of worry that folks have about climate change. But in this case, it's broken down by gender. And what you can see is across all age groups, uh, women are more concerned or worried about climate change than men. And so what that's telling me is that there's kind of this disparity, women are more concerned and women are also a lot more active when it comes to climate action, including local to sort of like regional to federal action, uh, women are at the front lines, often not given enough uh, or much recognition for their work. Uh, but then the other thing to note is that um, in the same study, the climate, the Yale Climate Communications Group looked at countries that had more women politicians um, and they saw that they passed more ambitious and more effective climate policy, uh, which is really, really awesome. So in, country, in places where women are in leadership positions, they are more ambitious and they're also more effective when it comes to climate change. So perhaps uh, we should be supporting women who are leading on climate. And I think we have lots of ways of doing that. One is there are a bunch of really amazing women who are now kind of stepping into the uh, spotlight and writing and producing films and podcasts um, and writing um, really cool newsletters that all kind of focus on telling the climate change story. So I just listed some of the ones that I'm a big fan of, including the All We Can Save book, which I am a co-author or contributed an essay to, but also podcasts like how to Save a Planet, Mothers of Invention, um, and Hot Take, and of course, Warm Regards and a Matter of Degrees. And then of course, if you're not reading the heated newsletter, it's really awesome, you should read that, it's wonderful. So there are all these different ways that women are telling the story of climate change from their point of view, um, much more ambitious, much more kind of telling truth to power, um, and it's an exciting thing to see and be a part of. And so I'll just kind of wrap up and think about, as we think about saving science, it's important to think about who we're saving science for. Um, one thing, again, Dr. Shanda Prescott Weinstein is, a, I'm a huge fan of her work. Um, and she has written a lot and really eloquently about science and about the enterprise and its lack of inclusion and equity. Um, the scientific community is especially dangerous for people who are not just marginalized along one axis, identity axis, but along multiple identity axes. People like her, people like me, um, she said, who are black, cis female, gender queer, living in chronic pain and pansexual, not just one of those things. So I think the point here is that um, there are people in science who are sort of uh, marginalized al along multiple axes or dimensions of identity um, that are suffering both from like gender discrimination but also racial discrimination and um, ableism and all of these different issues. Um, and it makes it more difficult to make it through any given day, let alone publish papers, get grants, where in those instances, there's also discrimination against um, all of those different identities. Um, and so intersectionally demands that we admit that whiteness and objectivity are not interchangeable. And indeed that this association has been damaging, that just because Science has been mostly a white-led enterprise, at least European science and the last 200 years of science in the US doesn't mean that it's objective um, and that actually that association is, can be really damaging. And what we really need to do is confront with radical honesty um, the issues that kind of plague science, especially issues of bias, discrimination um, and lack of equity and justice 
and what we need to be driving towards is transformation. And it's not that we need to like do anti-racist training so that we can, be, we can be more prepared to have students join us. It's that we must better prepare ourselves to become a space where students who are already prepared in their own interesting and unique ways naturally fit in. So we have to actually, <laughs> it's not just that we're creating anti-racist or an, like more equitable spaces, but in some instances, we just have to make space for other people who are already coming with those ideas and not stand in their way. And so I'll just wrap up by saying we're never just scientists. Um, so a few years ago, when we started 500 Women Scientists, um, we published this article in Scientific American talking about why focusing on gender is never enough um, and that we need to be really thinking about inclusion across all these other levels. So if we only focus on gender and science without explicitly addressing all forms of privilege and inequality, we fail to combat the institutional barriers and biases that push different groups of women out of science. And so when we started 500 Women Scientists, the question that kind of drove us was, how can science, uh, science be serving the public when it doesn't look like the public? When women still make up about 20% to 25% of STEM career, like jobs. Um, when we have this huge drop off in women um, and especially women of color um, and other sort of gender uh, minorities between the, between the graduate, uh, graduate level and postdoc level and professor levels. What is happening in those spaces that's, that is driving those people out of science? And so we started this organization um, and our mission is really ambitious. We wanna make science more open, inclusive and accessible and to fight racism, patriarchy and oppressive societal norms. Um, until very recently, we're, we were a fully volunteer run organization. Um, for the last four years, we've been basically run by an incredible team of volunteers. This is a picture of just a few of them. And uh, we've been able to accomplish a lot in our short uh, period of time, including launching local chapters all over the world. We call them pods. There's a great pod, a very active uh, and very equity focused pod in Seattle. We have over 500 pods now all over the world. Uh, actually, the majority of the pods are outside the US. Um, we have built a platform to make it really easy to find a woman or a gender minority scientist anywhere in the world. We call it GAGE. Um, we have a fellowship for women of color that recognizes the contributions that women of color make to make science more equitable and just. Um, we have lots of other programs. We host Wikipedia editing events where we create or edit pa pages for women scientists that don't exist on Wikipedia. We do a lot um, and it's all kind of driving towards answering this question of how can we make sure that science is actually representative of the public and is, and is serving the public truly and not just a few. And so I'll just wrap up by saying advocating for science requires us to advocate for women. Advocating for women means advocating for gender and racial justice. It means advancing immigrant disability and LGBTQIA rights, religious freedom, and challenging all forms of discrimination and inequality. That is the task at hand. Otherwise, what's the point of doing science? Because it's not actually serving society. And give you a little pep talk at the end. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do just justify now, justice now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You're not obligated to complete the work but neither are you free to abandon it. So let's, uh, let's get to work. And these are all of my cited sources and I'll be able to share, I'll send this to Mary and share um, the presentation and the sources with you afterwards. And I'll stop at this point. Thanks everyone. Well, since we can't hear the applause, I, I'll speak for everyone and just thanking you for such an interesting and really thought provoking presentation. Um, we have about seven or eight minutes for questions, which you can submit through the chat or through the Q&A function um, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And it looks like we already have a few questions lined up. Yeah, so I can go ahead and read those off. Um, the first question 
How will environmental impacts from renewable energy sources be addressed as wind and electric technologies are more heavily utilized? Thinking of impacts from both terrestrial and offshore wind turbines, offshore drilling and lithium, cobalt, et cetera, extraction for batteries. Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. And I think a really critical one for the deployment of any new or emerging technology. Um, and I'll just say that I don't have an easy answer for here's how you solve that. Um, because uh, mining for all of the rare earth elements that go into creating um, solar panels is really destructive. Um, the deployment of offshore wind or even onshore wind can be really destructive. And I had a boss at DOE that used to say there's no such thing as free lunch. That even when you go to a free lunch, graduate students, you'll know this, it's not actually free. You have to sit through something that you might not want to. Um, and so the thing here is that there is no such thing as free lunch. Everything we do, every single thing, even sequestering carbon and soils has impacts. Um, and so what we have to really do is be careful and honest and transparent about those impacts. We have a long history of not being transparent about impacts and then being surprised when they emerge. So I think as we move forward and deploy massive amounts of renewable energy, we have to do it in a way that addresses those impacts and also distributes the, the burden of impact um, more equally and not in the same communities that have already kind of borne the impacts of fossil fuel energy extraction and processing. Um, so yeah, I don't have a good answer. It's gonna be really hard. Um, I think the only way forward is with transparency and accountability. Um, the next question we have, can you reflect on what would be different between an activist scientist versus an activist science? Oh, that's a, wow, that's a really good question. So I think activist science is uh, maybe an oxymoron because if you're doing science with a particular outcome in mind, um, be that supporting a specific policy position or um, a specific outcome, then actually like that's already kind of a flawed and fraught process. So it's really different than being an activist who is also a scientist um, because you're not kind of leveraging science, the scientific process and potentially bastardizing it in the process to advance a particular agenda. Great question, something to think about. All right, and then a third question. Do you have any recommendations for white allies slash scientists to engage in resistance efforts such as the Dakota Access Pipeline without negatively impacting the safe space created by indigenous communities? Yeah, good question. Um, something that I think about and worry about and feel paralyzed by pretty frequently. So I'll just be honest and say that. I think um, one thing that I often hear is ally is not, allyship is a verb. And so it's not about sort of like claiming you're an ally and therefore you are one, but showing up, um, not trying to take the lead, but really showing up in support, listening, not taking up a lot of space, not claiming space that isn't yours. Um, and I guess doing a lot of listening and I mean, it's still fraught. And if the folks there don't want you there, then you have to be able to walk away and just like know that you're not needed at that point or not wanted at that point. And I, I think being like, you know, whiteness has this expectation of being cent central and this like idea that white people are always centered our ideas are always centered and heard and it can feel really uncomfortable when that's no longer the case. But that's what equity is, is that we can't always be centered. So just being able to also be okay, not being at the center of things. And um, yeah, just that it's gonna be hard. All right, and another question for you. So as we heard in the example you gave of the study which compared the impact of a story versus the impact of scientific facts, 
Carefully tailoring your communication strategy is really important. To do so well requires some level of education or training in science communication. How can we balance this with disciplinary scientific training and is it best or better to partner with experts in communication? Yeah, that's also a really good question. Y'all are a brilliant group of people. Um, so I think, well, first and foremost, I believe all scientists would benefit from broader communication training. Um, I mean, ultimately we are communicators. We're asked to write about the work that we do. And it's a great benefit to us as scientists to be able to communicate better in general, not just because it makes us better writers of papers and grants, but because it makes us just more effective communicators. It helps understand the work that we're actually doing it, doing by putting it into a broader context. I'll just say that I've taught science communication classes for scientists um, that include writing, but also podcast production and filmmaking, just because those different modes of communication really force scientists to think about their work in different ways. And there are lots of benefits from that besides the communication itself, that kind of feedback and reinforce the work and make it better. So one, I would say, all scientists would benefit from more communication training, um, even if they're not gonna become professional science communicators. Two, there is a large kind of body of scholarship and really exciting work in the science communication space, um, including folks that are professional science communicators. And we should be collaborating with um, early and often those people, um, bringing them into our research, um, having them help inform our research. I think it should be a, a really easy collaboration um, and one that we benefit from, especially like interdisciplinarily. And then obviously the third thing is there are these professional science communicators and we're not used to paying people for their work. And so one thing that's a challenge for us scientists is getting our heads around the fact that we have to pay people who are experts in something other than what we're expert in. And we have to think about how we're gonna pay those people. So when we write grants, can we put in additional funding to bring in a podcast crew or a filmmaking crew to make a short film about the work that we're doing? Can we pay uh, subcontracts to people who are doing communication work for the projects that we do? Just the idea of like being more comfortable paying people for their expertise um, and especially for science communication expertise because it's a real expertise and it should be valued. Well, we've thrown a lot of questions at you. So thank you so much for <laughs> fielding all of them one after the other. Um, we are going to go ahead and transition into the student Q&A session now, which will be a little bit less formal. So if you have some questions that weren't answered, um, you are free to stick around. And if you're not a graduate or undergraduate student, we just ask that you please sign off the webinar at this time after joining me and thanking Dr. Zelikova again for today's seminar. So we'll yeah, give Thanks. I just wanna say Dan Brown noted in the chat that the term scientism does have an existing meaning and it's a problematic one. So thank you, Dan. I didn't know that. And I'm gonna think about it and look it up and probably stop using it. Thanks. <laughs>